week staying cool uh, in uh, this warm weather that we're having. Uh, I want to take a few uh, prayer requests real quick. We'll uh, get started in our Sunday school lesson this morning. I, uh, I do want to make a, a few uh, updates. I spoke with uh, Brandy this morning about Cody. Many of you know they rushed Cody, little Cody, uh, to the hospital Tuesday morning at, to Vanderbilt. He was in respiratory uh, distress, and as they got him there to Vanderbilt, he's got, he had pneumonia, and uh, they ended up putting him in ICU for two days. And we uh, were, you know, Tommy and I went down Thursday evening and visited with, with him. They had just removed him from ICU into a normal room. And he seemed to be doing uh, somewhat better. He's still coughing and was on oxygen, but he wasn't on the CPAP where it was blowing in him, just uh, regular. And this morning I talked to her, and uh, she, uh, she shared with me that they've taken him completely off oxygen about 6 o'clock this morning, so he's breathing on his own without any help. So praise the Lord for that. Um, and so, uh, you know, God has answered prayers, and rejoicing that God is also working in their life in this manner and so we rejoice in that as well uh, spoke to Doran uh, he had a wreck yesterday and, and damaged his car a little bit so you know <clears throat> you know how it is as a Christian right uh, seems like you take two steps forward and get knocked back four or five steps and uh, when you're seeking after the Lord, when you're trying to live with the will of God, it seems like Satan is full blown and blast after you. And so this is exactly what's taking place with them. And we just need to continue to pray for them. Um, and hopefully she said that they'll get to come home tomorrow. She's wanting to see her two oldest boys before they leave for church camp. So that's another prayer request that we need to pray this morning. Uh, our children will be leaving tomorrow. Uh, we'll be taking them over to Westmoreland. Uh, to church camp all week. Matter of fact, Chance will be leaving this evening. He's going uh, to have a, a meeting tonight, and so he'll be there tonight through Friday as he helps with uh, the children this week. And Doran's two oldest sons, uh, Aiden and Brandon, are, are going on this church trip. So uh, I'll be praying for all the kids and them as well. Um, any other updates? Anybody have an update on Miss uh, Norma Jean since Wednesday? I haven't heard. Texted uh, Melissa yesterday. She's in a rehab in White House. Okay. She's doing pretty good. Where's that at? Which one? Do you know? I'm not at Texas right now. 31 across from Alice McKay next to the dollar store. Okay. Mm-hmm. I guess I'm never paid attention to it. Okay. Okay. So she is in rehab. Uh, doing better? How about Gerald? I spoke visited Monday, but I hadn't heard since then. I went Wednesday. He's he's doing good. He has a good attitude, smile on his face, and joyful. He's gaining strength. He's eating a lot better now. He's just ready for his wife to be home. Yeah. We took food to the Gale Lance home over there Friday night. Okay. We took the plates and everything to the Miller, so okay. he was really excited to get it. And Gail said he was eating it before she left the door. So. <laughs> Any other prayer concerns this morning? Those are the ones that we know about. Remember Red? <coughs> I remember Brother Red as well as he's continuous chemo treatments. I asked for prayer for my, my grandmother, Sarah Cupper. She uh, has a little onset of dementia. She was in the hospital this week. I visited her. She's doing a lot better. She was delusional earlier this week. And I had to give her two pints of blood uh, the other day. And she's supposed to go out for a couple weeks for physical therapy. She has a real hard time getting up or doing anything. Okay, well, let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning and lift these concerns up and also pray for our time together as we study the Word of God together that God would um, reveal Himself to us and that we'd learn more of who He is and perhaps even where we uh, fail as His people. And, uh, God be gracious and granted us repentance and restoration. Father, we thank you for this uh, this day that you have blessed us with and the privilege of gathering together in this place. 
Lord, to study your word and study and, and to not only study your word, but to hear from you. Oh God, we desperately need to hear from you. Uh, with so many things that we hear of each and every day in, in this world, Lord, more than anything, we need to hear from you. We need to hear your uh, desire for us as your children. And not only do we need to hear it, but Lord, we need to apply it to our lives. Father, we need to walk in the statutes and the laws that you have granted us so graciously. And uh, Father, as we come to you in prayer, Father, we do lift up these names that's been mentioned. Lord, we continue to pray for Cody. We pray, God, that you would touch his lungs, that you would heal the pneumonia, and that you would ease his breathing. And Lord, we praise you, God, how you have already been working and healing him. And, and so, Lord, we just pray that through this, God, you would make yourself real and known to Brandy and Doran and to that whole family. God, that this would be a, a, a process of, of your grace, Lord, upon them drawing them closer to you, and ultimately bringing them to salvation. Father, for Norma and Gerald, we, we continue to pray for them for strength and for grace. And Lord, we know that your grace is sufficient. And Lord, Gerald even reminded me that he was holding and trusting to that fact. And Lord, he don't understand why all these things are befalling him, but he knows that, that you are on your throne and that you are a good and perfect God. That's the Lord, that's the God that he is worshiping and trusting in, and we are thankful for that. Uh, Father, for Red, and Lord, just uh, we hear of new reports, Lord, of these rejoicing and, and, and good spirits, and Lord, it's just a testimony of your grace in his life. And Lord, for Garrett's grandmother, we pray for uh, her sickness. We pray, Lord, that you would touch her, that you would that you would make yourself known to her through this time. and Lord, often we don't understand why sicknesses and, and things of this uh, of magnitude happens when we just look at it from a human standpoint. But God, when we look to your word, we are reminded that this shouldn't surprise us, that we live in a fallen world. We live in a sin, curse, sin, sick world. And God, we need your grace. These people need your grace to sustain them. Lord, we know and trust that you will do exactly that. Father, we pray that as Brother Garrett comes this morning to, to lead us in chapter 4 of I Will Serve, Lord, that you would speak through him, that you would open our hearts and our minds and our, our ears, Lord, to receive the truth, and that each one of us as believers in Christ here at Pleasant Hill, Lord, that we would be challenged and convicted and most of all that we would be changed more into the image of your son Jesus Christ through your word for our good but ultimately for your glory. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. 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 One of the things he points out in regards to Heather in this chapter is the transition she made from the, the mindset of being a self-serving Christian in the church.
finding the joy in being one who serves others. And uh, it says on page 47, the next last paragraph, the last sentence, that um, better yet she thought it was a joyous church because the members were serving. The members were serving. And then on page 48, turn there real quick. It says, the change in Heather, it's the middle paragraph, the change in Heather was noticeable to herself and to others. I just find so much joy in serving others, she said. That's how most of the members are at my church now. We don't serve in ministry because of some legalistic guidelines. We serve because we are motivated by joy to do so. Heather used to dread going to church on Sundays. Now she wakes up with anticipation about attending, and she is involved in a small group and at least one short-term ministry each year. She serves in areas that energize her, not in areas where someone has given her a guilt trip to participate. So joy in service, is that such a thing? Do we find joy in serving others? Has let anyone have a testimony as far as going from a time in their life where they just attended church and uh, was seeking to be served, and then what changed when they became a serving church member? They yeah, always served, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Obviously, it takes effort, right? It takes effort, it takes discipline, it takes sacrifice. And that's what I think he brings up principally when he goes into the story of Jesus in Matthew 20, and uh, I think 20, verses 20 through 28, uh, where he talks about the, the sons of Zebedee, James and John, and uh, Christ's example there. That Christ is one who has set the example, and uh, principally so, we see that Christ is one who sacrificed himself, he was obedient even to the point of death, death on the cross. And so, service to others ought to be motivated and fill us with joy because we are experiencing Christ's likeness. We're looking to Christ. We're serving just as Christ served. So, let's look at that uh, story. Matthew chapter 20, verses 20 through, makes 20 through 28. Make sure of that. I think, too, that uh, we're, we're commanded to serve, but it's also a calling, so there is joy, and it's not a, like what we would call a job, so it's right. not going to be too burdensome, we're not going to um, grow burned out, it's a calling, and it's a gift from God, so there should be joy in it. Yeah, there should be joy, Brother Rick's saying that it's a calling, not just simply a job, and unfortunately, there are churches today throughout America that have... Uh, pastors who are working a job, they have church members who are working a job, accountants who are in the church, staff members who it's simply a job. They come in, a so to speak, punch the clock and then clock out. The difference between working a job and then fulfilling a calling, something that bears upon you night and day, every moment, that is in the back of your mind when you're doing this, when you ought to be thinking about that, you're thinking about this. Um, it's a difference between a calling. And Lord willing, if we have come to faith in Jesus Christ, we have possession of the Holy Spirit by God's grace, there is this desire that overflows in our life to find ways of serving others, to sacrifice, uh, to pray for others, to have this newfound godly concern, especially for the household of God that you did not have before. You have no reason, in a sense, in of ourselves and of our flesh, here today for any of us to love or care for the other. We're so different. Um, there's such a diversity in the body. But God has so called us together as one body with all our differences, all our backgrounds, all our life experiences, all of our own personal sins and struggles. And yet he has knit us together in the love of Christ. And so I, compelled by the love of Christ, love you. Not because you and yourself are worthy, and you don't love me because I and myself am worthy, but because of Jesus Christ. And we recognize uh, the gift of grace given to each one of us, and Him calling us all as sinners and bringing us into one body. Um, and we rejoice in that, and we 
serve one another, we suffer one another when each suffers, and rejoice when each rejoices. So here in Matthew 20, a mother's request, that uh, speaks about, of course, uh, the sons of Zebedee, James and John, and the mother, she comes up to Jesus, and Jesus in verse 21 says to her, what do you want? She said to him, say that these two sons of mine are to sit, one at your right hand, and one at your left, in your kingdom. Jesus answered, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am to drink? They said to him, We are able. He said to them, You will drink my cup, but to sit at my right hand and at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared by my Father. And when the ten heard it, they were indignant at the two brothers. But Jesus called them to him and said, You know what the rulers of the Gentiles, excuse me, that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom. For many. So here from uh, the words of Jesus, we see a contrasting in the, the self-serving, self-angradizing uh, approach of this mother and James and John. This wanting to be propped up, to have recognition, to be given a place of honor, to have prestige. And then the contrast with Jesus, who as the Son of Man, the Son of God, came to earth and emptied himself, so to speak, becoming a servant, obedient to the death on the cross. And uh, he sets himself forward here. Verse 28, he says, Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. And so Jesus is our principal example of servanthood. He puts himself as an example. And in fact, his obedience, his way of life, all that is something that we, we pray, um, so to speak, that we be conformed to his image. He's the perfect image of God. So, um, and he puts his sacrifice uh, in the forefront of our minds as well, to give his life as a ransom for many. I think it's pretty clear to see that James and John were not acting in a very self-sacrificial way. They were seeking honor from others. They wanted to be up there... Um, essentially with Jesus, as if on the stage together, at his right and left hand, next to the throne, wanting others to see them, to recognize them, to serve them. And also, in a sense, in this courtroom of God, in this throne room of God, sitting at the right and left hand of Jesus, that they would have authority over others, that they would be the right and left hand of the King, the Lord of Lords, and that, if anything, they would be in a position to tell others what to do. Jesus refutes that entire idea. And uh, he confronts it then and there. It's, I guess you might say in a sense, uh, almost, um, I don't want to say church discipline necessarily, but he addresses the issue face to face. He calls them over to himself and he tells them, he refutes that mentality they have, that wrongheadedness, and sets them straight. And I think it'd be fair to say that James and John and their mother were not captivated by grace. They were not characterized by selfless love. They were self-serving. So, it reminds us too that if Jesus is our example, is the author and finisher of our faith, that he sets the example for leadership, that leaders are those who ought to serve and not simply be served. Jesus is our example for them. So, any thoughts, comments? Questions? I think it's, uh, it seems so elementary, you know? It doesn't, I mean, this is what we've learned ever since Sunday school when we grew up in church, and yet you would think it's so elementary, why don't we grab a hold of it? Why is it so hard for us to, to obey? Yeah. You know, why are we always seeking our to put ourselves first rather than 
I mean, the last paragraph of chapter 40, or page 49, you know, he just kind of just cuts to the chase, doesn't he? You know, um, how many yeah. of us seek our own, you know, to put ourselves first rather than others? And yet it's so elementary, people say it's simple, but yet we don't do it. That tells us what? That we need to learn more of who Christ is and humble ourselves and apply the word. Yep. And it can be done. I mean, we see James and John here, but uh, we don't get the rest of the story until but when we read their letters. Right. We see how humble and willing to serve and sacrifice they are. So I mean, there, there is hope for us. And by God's grace, we can do it. Right. But reminded of uh, going through. John, First John, I should say, and just how much love is characterized throughout First John, um, his love for the church, and how he sacrificed for the church, his great concern. So, thank God that the grace of God changes people for the better. The grace of God is not some vain, vain thing. It it goes out and it accomplishes what He has set it out to do. What God's word uh, purposes to do, He accomplishes it. Serving one another in our household. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think if we limit the application of servanthood to simply this building or each other, then I think we miss, perhaps you might say, the missiological purpose of Christ. That Christ came for everyone to offer everyone grace and salvation. Um, and if we're to serve others and to show the love of Christ, should we withhold that love from anyone? Should we pick favorites, pick and choose? Obviously, there's only so many hours in the day. We only have so much energy. There's a certain context in which we minister. Right? We're here in Orlando, Tennessee. But God has graced us with families. He's graced us with a local church here, a community. Each of us have perhaps ties in our community that uh, others may not have. A circle of influence where we can share the grace of God. We can proclaim the gospel. We can witness, be an encourager. Um, I think what Chad mentioned is, reminds me of the discount of the familiarity or the familiar. That sometimes you become so used to something, so familiar with something, you simply forget about it or simply count it as ordinary or, or trivial. Uh, here in our context, we might be quick to discount uh, how unique uh, the farming livelihood is. Hey, we're surrounded by farmers here. We have farms all over the place. But if you go somewhere that perhaps um, New England area, somewhere where there's a lot less land, uh, if you go to um, you know, the inner city, people who have gr grown up, been raised, and never left Nashville, for example, they're used to the urban jungle. Streets of pavement and asphalt, little yards, little houses stacked on top of each other. And uh, so we take it for granted sometimes where we live. In the same way, uh, this idea of service in the church, it's easy to take for granted. If you've been raised in the church, grew up in the church, you uh, come to faith, it's, you pretty quickly early on, I think, come to some idea that we ought to be serving one another. The longer you've been in church, though, perhaps the more you kind of grow complacent and kind of forget the impetus with which we are to serve. So, um, this leads then with, with Jesus as our example. He goes um, in the same passage over to, or section over to page 50. He talks about Jesus as our example, him serving, and uh, Paul, uh, joy, the joy of serving others. And he speaks of Philippians chapter 2, which of course... We'll, we'll turn there, if you have your Bibles, Philippians chapter 2, epistle from Paul, and in chapter 2, again speaking, with some very uh, significant application for us on, on serving in Christ's example of, of humility. Philippians 
That's Philippians chapter 2. I'll read for us for a bit. I think we'll look at 1 through 18 pretty quickly. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Verse 14, Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish, in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain, even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. Obviously, there's so much. I think it's always good when you can look to Scripture. Our teaching ought to be based or founded upon Scripture. In this passage, I think uh, Tom Rayner references it because of its extreme applicability to the idea of serving in the church. We have Christ's example. We have Paul, his love and concern for the Philippian church, um, and him putting in there that you know he's going to be poured out as a drink offering. But in the beginning there, in verse 2, he references uh, that he wants them to complete my joy by being in the same mind. Paul throughout this, despite knowing uh, of what's to come eventually of him, his being poured out, in a sense, his death in serving the church, he's doing so, he's serving with joy. There's persecution for those who are believers, but that does not stop Paul from his extreme passion in serving. We know that Paul was quite the missionary, traveling to numerous places. Um, He had plans that went unfulfilled in God's providence. But we have... So many epistles written by him, so many exhortations and admonitions uh, with which we can uh, live our lives and better serve one another in the church. So, does anyone have any thoughts about this passage here, Philippians 2? Anything uh, strike you as we read it? Instead of 
furthering my own so easy to become self-serving and um, seeking our own desires and pleasures, our own convenience. It's so easy. That's, I think, part of our, our sin nature. That's, when we're born, that's just kind of how we're set. Um, you know, it's the uh, me first. I've got to survive, me, myself, and I. Um, I've got to get mine while I can. You only live once kind of mentality that we want to take things in for ourselves. And um, some people to the extreme of it doesn't matter what it might cost others. You know, we're willing to sacrifice the joy and um, the benefits of others in order to get something that benefits us, to fulfill our desires. And that is worldly. That is um, how the world lives, and we're not to be of the world, even though we are in the world. So... Humility in the mind of Christ is God that it's ours in Christ Jesus. I mean, we have possession of it. It's not an option. I mean, this is who we are when we have to identify with Christ. Um, so, again, it's not an option. We are supposed to be humble. We are to have the mind of Christ. And it's ours. It's you know, part of our, our salvation, our inheritance. You're, you're right. And, and that's, I think, you know, we have participation in the Spirit, he says in verse 1 of the same mind, the same love, in verse 2, being in full accord in one mind. He says, this mind which is yours in Christ Jesus. This is a spiritual gift from God. That upon your conversion, upon your receiving the Holy Spirit, your repentance and faith in Jesus Christ, you get this. You get this. Now, we sometimes drop the ball because despite having this gift, we choose to operate apart from it. We choose to go back, uh, as I think Proverbs says, like a dog to its own vomit. We want to go back to that old nature rather than to um, abound in joy and to take advantage of what God has given us. You know, someone can give you a gift and uh, you can hold on to it but not care for it. Um, and I, I pray that we would not be that way. That we would actually take, take full advantage of it. That we would glorify God an example of a Christ-like service. Another thing that I thought about was uh, talks about the grumbling or questioning, you know, my flesh and knee-jerk reactions. Well, what if they say something that, you know, is not right? Well, the first thing we need to do is measure it up to Scripture. You know what I mean? And if it's scriptural, we shouldn't grumble or question. But I think that's often what we do is when it goes against our tradition, we want to grumble uh, or question or dispute about it. Um, and we need to, uh, at least in myself, I need to, to repent from that because it's not traditions that we should be holding on to. That's what Jesus, you know, rebuked the Pharisees so many times for. But we should be looking to serve one another uh, in a biblical way. And that, if it is extra biblical, that's the only type of grumbling that it should ever happen. Right. When, when Scripture lays something out and it's clear, and we're able to, to read it and understand and know what we ought to do or ought not to do, then I would say it's, it's sin for us to go against Scripture. And so if we do have a leader who is pointing us to Scripture and serving in accordance with the truth, you know, we ought to um, be joyful in doing so. And to rebel against that leader is actually to rebel against Scripture, which is the word of the Lord. So um, you are right. It, it comes back to what God has spoken, what He's revealed. Um, and there may be some areas within the church and ministries where we have the freedom to, to do other things. There's no clear teaching in Scripture. And hopefully, in those cases, rather than looking to our own interests, but we will look to the interests of the whole church. What benefits everyone? What, how can we attain to unity in the body in whatever we do, whether it's what I want done or they want done, that we'd have unity and therefore we would also have joy because we know that we are in one mind and it's glorifying because we are a testimony, a living testimony of God's grace.
first night in ten, especially um, Jesus needs to be exalted. And, and we need to remember our place is not at the right and left of Jesus, but every knee should bow. And I think we can't serve each other unless we've got that perspective. You're right. You're absolutely right. It's all about him. You know, it's the, old, uh, it's the old Sunday school answer, right? Someone asks you a question, you don't know the answer, you just say Jesus. You know? There's a certain truth in that, though. It's all about Jesus. It was God's plan from the beginning, and uh, he's going to be what we adore and love and worship, our sovereign triune God in all his glory for what he's done. Um, who he is. All right, that's, that's good. Any other thoughts before we move on? All right, so we should desire an attitude of Jesus, which is one principally of um, obedience we see in his life, his walk. Um, I was going to mention also he- Hebrews 12, you know, um, he says, therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, um, fixing our eyes upon the author and fixer of our faith, who, uh, the author and uh, foundation of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross and despised the shame, sitting down at the right hand of the throne of God. He is who it's all about. And uh, he set us the example, and he is one who for the joy set before him, endured the cross for the joy that is confounds our normal way of thinking who in joy would go to a piece of Roman execution equipment who would be scourged and mocked um, belittled that they would you know even though he is the son of God the king of kings the king of the Jews would be they would ascribe that to him in a mocking way and he'd be crucified and killed there um, before the whole Roman world. Um, and it was with joy that he did that. Shows us his plan, his purpose, and um, his love, ultimately. And I, I wouldn't leave it simply at his love for us, as great as it is, but for his love of his glory, because he is the highest good. He goes on to speak about motivations for service in uh, this next passage. Beginning page 51, going over to 52, he speaks about um, visiting and serving the homebound, working local missions house, and this challenge um, of of committing to a minimum amount of hours for service. What can motivate us to service? What should be our motivations for serving, for choosing to undertake service in the local church, even uh, perhaps some kind of challenge um, like he's mentioned here? The glory of God. It's a very spiritual answer. What what moves us to to set the glory of God as a, a motivation? Yet really we can't engage in worship if we've not been saved. If we've not come to an end of ourselves, seeing who we are in our sinfulness, and seeing who God is in His perfections, and uh, seeking Him, trusting Him for salvation, receiving that forgiveness, we can't really engage in worship. I don't think we can engage in a legitimate act of service. There's many people who serve or do things that are morally upright, whether it be the Jehovah's Witnesses or or any other cult-like group or Buddhist, whoever it might be. Many people um, set moral examples and do things that are characterized by a uh, higher morality, doing what benefits others. But ultimately, 
if it does not find its end in the glory of God, then it is done in a self-serving matter. It's done with man as the end, at the very least, the benefit of man. And that's, you know, what Brother Rick said is true. It should be done for the glory of God. But it is a very spiritual answer because it takes a spiritual mind to look to God and to consider His glory above all else, above each other, and that my serving you and seeking out your good, that you're simply not the end of it, but by doing so, I'm, in my mind, seeking to serve God, to show forth His love, show forth His grace, to shine forth the reality of forgiveness in my life as I love you. So God is the end for which man was made, to glorify Him, enjoy Him forever. So any other morality, any other religion out there, you'll find um, is going to be characterized in some way by idolatry, false religion, false worship. We see, let's see, let's go. If there's no other thoughts, any thoughts, comments before we move on? I was just thinking what you, know, you said and what Rick said about God's glory being the end of why we serve. And, and that's right. What Sister Darlene said that you know, we're motivated by God's glory in, in Christ and what Christ has done for us in serving others. And, um, I think that's the foundation of, of everything, like you said, for missions, for, for preaching, for teaching Sunday school, for witnessing to the lost, uh, whatever, feeding uh, those who are sick, hospital visits, nursing home visits, whatever we do, um, the end, you know, is the glory of God. That God would get the glory of that uh, right. because of what Christ has done in us. And, um, and only, like you said, it's a spiritual answer because uh, being regenerated and being born again, we're spiritual beings. I mean, you know, we're, we're filled with the Holy Spirit, and that's what motivates us to do that. And I thought about kind of NASCAR. I don't know why it just came to my mind, but in NASCAR, uh, if there's a penalty, there's a black flag. And when they wave that black flag, a car is supposed to come in to wait for however long. But that car can stay out there and do laps as long as it wants to do laps. But those laps don't count. And I think about how many, how many people who try to do works and deeds, and the end is for themselves rather than the glory of God. It's just uncounted laps if you want to. Right. It's useless. It's worthless. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, you know, you don't have to help me remember. Paul speaks somewhere in a passage regarding how uh, on that day everything that we have laid up or built that stubble or, or hay, you know, grass, it's going to burn away. But what will remain are those things that have lasting value, kind of the, the gold. It's all about the foundation upon which we build, what we do. It has to be Christ. If we do things apart from Him or seeking our own interest or simply the interest of fellow man, it's going to amount to nothing on that day. You can live the most moral life, um, it would seem, uh, Mahatma Gandhi of sorts, but if Jesus Christ is not your all in all, you've got nothing. So. All right, so uh, from 52 to 53, this next section serving through small groups. Um, I kind of summarize this, this whole section as finding opportunities for service. Finding opportunities for service. Do we have opportunities for service here in our church, our context, our community? If so, what are they? And absolutely, we got opportunities, but let's just throw some out. There's probably no wrong answers here. There's so much. Feeding the football team. The football team. That's, that's coming up not too long from, from now, right? Take up prayer requests. Prayer request. Strawberry fest. Strawberry fest. So missions or outreach, evangelism opportunities that we have. Shut in. Sick. VBS, serving the nursery. Ties and offering, giving of our, uh, what we've been given in order to support the church. Fellowship meal, serving one another through food and drink, serving that, preparing food for others. Assisted living. Assisted living. 
visiting there. Audiovisual, our tech department. Uh, tremendous amount of work they do in order to uh, provide another uh, ministry of our church and uh, musicians playing. You know their talents and abilities, which they grace us with. Greeting people. It's amazing how often a kind word, you know, encouraging. Encouraging one another. Some people are just gifted with being optimist and just having a kind word to say, which you never know how another brother or sister, how their day or week's been. So something simple like that can be powerful. Preaching and teaching the word. All our, our teachers in this church and uh, the labor that goes into that. Church camp. Church camp. Church camp. Yeah, church camp. Taking the church sign. You serve on a committee. I mean, we do a lot here. There's probably more that we could do. And we don't want to be legalistic. But I think it comes down to what our desires are. Are we content to do not very much? Or are we thinking maybe that we ought to, because of our motivations for serving, seek out other opportunities and to do as much as we can. We don't want to maybe say, well, I don't want to do too much and get burned out, then I won't serve and use that as kind of a, uh, a cop-out for, for not serving. I think Scripture teaches us that we all have a spiritual gift. It does. I think, you know, we need to know what our spiritual gift is and get plugged in where God has gifted us. You know, Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, 12. And, and, you know, it's very well laid out there. Yeah. Uh, because not everybody's gifted to be a teacher. You know? You're right. We're going to get to that, so. Yeah, okay, no, you're good. You're good. You probably need to hurry up so we can. You're exactly right. And that's, that's one thing. Um, my brother Rick said last week, overall, this book is really good. It provides a lot. Um, we have to think about... Um, at least our concern, I think, is a scriptural basis for what he's teaching. And so one thing, if I critique this chapter, would have been maybe some discussion or reference to spiritual gifts. I don't think he referenced that at all if I, if I missed that. So because if we're going to serve in the local church, the truth is we have been given gifts with which we can especially serve with. I mean, we can all, in a sense, uh, do certain things. But the Lord has graced us to do certain things even better. Um, and has used that, or to use that to build up the church. So here in just a second, we'll get to that. So where or what should our focus be in service? In the church or in the community, where or what is our focus? I think we can In the church or in the community, yeah. The gospel, yeah. God, the gospel, yeah. God's grace. I mean, that's. And then focus in all of those areas. Church and community. Yeah. 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 And so I think if we. Those all kind of comprise um, a way of understanding God's glory. I mean, He's a God of the gospel, He's a God of salvation, a God of love, <clears throat> a God of, of wrath but who has turned away his wrath in Jesus Christ, giving us a reason to worship, to, to draw us to him in repentance and faith. So um, we ought to have, be characterized not by negativity and pessimism in our service, but by positivity and optimism. And that's, I think, hard to do sometimes when we're plagued by various sicknesses, illnesses, time constraints, life, life happens, um, you know, car crashes, sick children, all in a short time span, death in families. Um, but if we re retain our focus of God's glory and remember what he's done for us in Jesus Christ, I think we'll find ultimately not a short-term, nearsighted focus, but a long-term, grand picture of God's glory, of an eternal plan, one that isn't simply here and now, it isn't 20 years from now, but it is a forever plan, one that can make us positive and, and remain optimistic no matter what happens in life, knowing that, yes, persecution will come, fiery trials will come, but 
one day we will be gathered together. No more sickness, no more tears, no pain, in glorified bodies around the throne of our Savior for all eternity, around the one who is shining bright like the sun. I think that would empower us and help us during those spiritual doldrums where we're just simply tired of serving, we're wore out literally, physically, can't hardly get out of bed. We are just weak. We, we just pretty much at an end of ourselves. And we ought to remember in those times not to look to ourselves and our situation and how we feel, but upon something objective, something more sure, Jesus Christ. Um, he says, he mentions this one lady in her story. Um, basically, four things she did. One was she stopped critiquing the church. Not that we don't give words of encouragement or admonishments or point others to Scripture, um, but we ought not to be a, a judge over others, lording our opinions over others. Second, uh, she began praying for an attitude change. This is on page 54, by the way. Um, she prayed for her attitude to change to one of, of servanthood. She prayed for the church and for leaders in the church. Um, and she began committing. She simply began committing. For her, it was one hour a week. She just set that minimum bar. Um, so that's something to think about. But I'm going to kind of hurry on to 1 Corinthians 12. If you have your Bibles, if you turn there, 1 Corinthians 12. Brother Chad was saying, 1 Corinthians 12 and actually Romans 12 are both passages which deal with spiritual gifts. And also, interestingly, Romans 13 and 1 Corinthians 13 both mention love and discuss that some in brief. Kind of a coincidence with how the chapters are divided. 1 Corinthians 12. I'm going to read for us pretty quickly and run through some things. So 1 Corinthians 12. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols, however you were led. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says, Jesus is accursed, and no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except in the Holy Spirit. Now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service but the same Lord, and there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good, for to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit, to another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, the ability to distinguish between spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit, who apportions to each one individually as he wills. So, we see here, uh, you know, I was studying this passage, and Brittany and I were talking about this last night. Having read it in the past and last night, at first there seems to be almost this joint, disjointed uh, line of reasoning that Paul has. When he begins in verse 1 in chapter 12, concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. And then he goes from talking about spiritual gifts to mute idols, which you were formerly led astray by. And then he goes back to talking about spiritual gifts. Seems like he throws in there a quick warning about idols. One thing we have to remember in the context of Paul is that he is writing to a church in Corinth. It is a trade city. There are idols or false religions that abound. And within these is obviously worship, acts of worship, including sacrifice. Um, there's, you know, the temples within gr the Greek religion. You had people like Aphrodite, the sex goddess. You had Ares, who is the god of war. Um, and then you have uh, you know, Zeus, you have others. Within the Old Testament, we saw other gods, such as Baal, or Chemosh, or Moloch, who they would sacrifice, especially Chemosh and Moloch, especially Moloch, they would sacrifice children to be burnt alive. And they would pray to these gods for benefits. 
Now, in polytheistic religions such as the Greeks, uh, the Greek religion, they would pray to different gods who were characterized by different attributes. For example, um, Athena was kind of a goddess of strategy and uh, like naval warfare, and Ares was one of the god of war, also known as Mars. And the Romans had pretty much the same religion as the Greeks, but their names were different. In fact, I think all our planets in our solar system are named after Roman gods. Mars, Jupiter, Jupiter is Zeus, um, Neptune is um, Poseidon. So in the Trojan War, actually, it was, I think, Athena and Mars, um, excuse me, Athena and Ares who were in opposition to one another. And Athena pretty much won. So I say that it, Paul also, you know, when we looked at uh, in Acts, you have the Areopagus, which is the Mars Hill which is connected to the god of Mars, which is Ares, the god of war. And so people would pray or do sacrifices for skill in battle, for skill in uh, naval warfare, depending who they're praying to. People would sacrifice children to Molech for the rain, for the seasons. And so there was this sense in which you would worship a god, and they would give you benefits. They would give you gifts. You would sacrifice to them, you would pray to them, and they would bless you in certain ways. That you would be more empowered for some task, or you would receive wain, uh, rains and uh, a great harvest or fertility to have children. Or that your animals would have um, offspring. So, Paul is confronting this idea that you know, now that you, if you indeed possess the Spirit of God, you receive gifts. He's saying, now I don't want you to be uninformed. In verse 1, we take it for granted as Christians and New Testament believers who have the whole revelation here that we receive spiritual gifts. We take it for granted. The church here at Corinth needed to be taught about spiritual gifts, that indeed by your faith in Christ, that God has bestowed to you gifts which are meant to build up the church. And that only people who can truly proclaim that Jesus is Lord have received these gifts. No one who worships another God or says Jesus is accursed, exercises these. So if they were to see some other gift, or they, they saw some kind of power being worked, it was not something from God. It was uh, either demonic in nature, but it was not truly a divine gift from the one true living God. And he says, there's kind of a parallelism between 4, 5, and 6, where he says varieties of gifts, varieties of service, varieties of activities, same spirit, Lord, and God. That's a Trinitarian kind of progression there, uh, pointing us to the truth of our one true and living God, who is three and yet one. Um, and he says in verse 7, to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. So the purpose of our gifts is for the common good, not for ourselves. It's for building up the church. Uh, I have to hurry things up. It's about to an end of our time. In chapter 13, he goes on to the way of love, that you may have prophecy, speak in tongues, um, all these gifts, but yet if they are not controlled by love and for building up one another, they're nothing. So, principally, then, all our gifts ought to be done or used in conjunction with love, love for one another, love for God. And uh, he lays out in 1 Corinthians 12 various gifts Romans 12 includes those as well. Gifts of exhortation, gifts of serving, uh, you know, gifts of giving, charity, giving to the church. And so, if I can be so bold as to give us homework, I would ask you to read Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12 and maybe study about spiritual gifts. If you're not sure what perhaps maybe you've been given, and... Um, Maybe as well, we'll need to do some other teaching sometime. We, Brother Chad, Rick, and I can do something else uh, regarding spiritual gifts. Um, so I, I dare say that maybe some here aren't too sure maybe what their gifts are. But we know that there's many opportunities to serve in the church, whether it's providing food, 
giving our, our money. Maybe we've been blessed with a particular job um, or a financial situation to where we can give abundantly more than others in the congregation. But has God moved your heart to do that? Has God moved your heart to give of your time to others? Has God moved your heart to teach others and to study? The Holy Spirit gives us these desires, a calling, a certain internal awareness, um, which joined with Scripture, scriptural teaching, um, God can make it clear to a person how they've been equipped uniquely for service in their church. So we have any thoughts before we close out? I just say, want to say thank you, <coughs> Pastor. Uh, thank you for your service because, as Garrett mentioned, we do a lot here at this church to be a small, small country church. And I shared with Brother Tommy last this past week, I visited a church, a larger church last Sunday. They run about 200. <coughs> and we come into the auditorium, we sat there, the pastor asked me afterwards, he's a good friend of mine, he said, can you help me critique our church? I said, yeah, you got a very unfriendly church. We did not have one person come up to us, shake our hand, thank us. Their door greeters was at the door of the sanctuary, not at the, at the back door, giving us a bulletin. And they, they just gave us, gave us a bulletin, that was it. But no one out of 200 people never said, good to have you, glad that, glad that you're with us, oh, you're visiting. And I mean, we sat up, you know, the boy's like, let's not sit on the front row, and guess where I sat? I sat on the second row. And I'm gonna tell you that, that is huge. That is huge. And, uh, but thank you for all that you do. Many of you serve in many different aspects of the church, with the football team, giving money, food. You may not be able to go to the school, but you, you, you pray, and, and so just thank you. That, that means, means a lot, and, and it is to the glory of God. So. Amen. There's no further word. I'll, I'll close this out in prayer. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for our salvation, which is in Jesus Christ. God, we're thankful that you have called us all together, one body, and that each of us have a function. We function together, and in our great diversity, there should be unity. We are one body, though each of us have our own functions. And so, God, we pray that you are glorified here at Pleasant Hill, that you bring an awareness uh, further of our own unique spiritual gifts, and that, moreover, you would join us uh, with a strong desire to see you glorified as we um, use these. God, we're thankful for the many acts of service that have been done here in this church over the many years that this church has been in existence. God, we pray that you continue to glorify yourself here at Pleasant Hill, that you build us up, strengthen us together, knit us in the bonds of love which are in Christ Jesus, and that we have the same mind which is ours in Christ Jesus. God, may you be glorified this day the proclamation of your word through our pastor, Brother Chad, will help us to understand more about who we are as, as men, as mankind, uh, your creation. And Father, that you be glorified as we are challenged with the truth. Father, take from us any misunderstandings and uh, any desire to uh, believe different from your word. Father, may we submit to you always in spirit and truth. May you be glorified. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.